Good morning, YouTube. Today, we're going to talk about F-body radiators, the vertical stand-up variety, and how hot they get, and how to maybe cool them down. And this is where, then you play the intro. That's where the intro goes. Right now. F-body stand-up radiators, they get kind of hot. Who when you got a big old turbo hanging up off the spot. All right. Now, the reason for this video is this thing runs hot. Like 235 degrees and not slowing down hot. It's just climbing. It's soaring through the atmosphere like a phoenix uh -huh. to its eternal resting flame of peace and transmero birdness. Now, if you jump on Google and you search F-body stand-up radiator, you're going to see a few threads from like LS1 Tech, a couple of YouTube videos, other things. Now, they all have kind of one thing in common, and that is the radiator that people use and the fan that people use, the dual fans that people use, rather. This setup has the Griffin radiator that everybody runs. It's 15 and a half inches tall. It's 27 and a half inches wide. However, I have never had good luck out of pusher fans, and that's what everyone says to run. You got to run these pusher fans. You got to run these pusher fans. I have a couple issues with the pusher fans that people run from a, uh, not an experience standpoint, but like a functionality standpoint, and I'll explain that. Before I can dive into my problems, though, I'll show you what I have now. These are two, I believe they're Flexalite. I can't remember the exact brand. Maybe you can see it down there. Permacool, my fault. Dual Permacool 10-inch polar fans. I have a little bit of distance to the turbo. Obviously, the heat blanket on the turbo makes it look like it's closer than it really is. But my thought was two high CFM polar fans on the backside of the radiator would be a better option than two pusher fans. The two pusher fans that everyone says to run. And I want to put my foot in my mouth and hope I'm wrong here. But the reason that I don't like the idea of the pusher fans that people run are half of the pusher fan, not half, but a good chunk of the pusher fan actually sits over the end tank on both sides. So they run 12 inch dual pusher fans that aren't mated up against the radiator. They're not offset, you know, an eighth of an inch or something. They're offset a good half inch or more because they sit on the end tanks. And they do not, obviously, they, they, they just don't cover the core itself on the ends. In my experience, having that too big of a gap from the fan to the radiator can cause issues, especially without the use of a shroud, etc. if you're running them on the backside as a puller. So again, I hope I put my foot in my mouth here, and that's not the case. Now, these are the polar fans that everybody runs. Dorale is the brand, part number, let's see if I can find it on here. The part number is a 16925. They're also like finger chopper 9000s. You can see like there is nothing, there's nothing that's gonna stop you from cutting a finger off when you mount these things. So again, two of those mounted on the radiator, they offset and they sit on the end tanks when you finish mounting them. So again, like I said, I hope I'm wrong, they overlap basically from here over will sit over the end tank and it won't sit on the actual radiator itself. To get to that point, I got to pull the intercooler off and I got to pull this little core support bar off that holds the trans cooler. And then I can actually slide the radiator fans in, get the old ones off. Also, quick little pro tip. When you have these nylon lock T-bolt clamps, don't use an impact on them because if you, you do, you'll strip out the nylon more often than not. Or like me, these are not like the super expensive, nice over the top ones. You'll end up just breaking the actual bolt itself. So just use a ratchet, go slow, take your time. Intercooler out of the way. This is that bracket I was talking about. It holds the intercooler itself. Just pull the bolts out a little bit so I can snake, again, the fans in from underneath this side so I don't have to pull the whole radiator out. Obviously, there is a size difference. <laughs> that is what she said. It wouldn't hang off the sides of the end tanks if there wasn't. But again, I'm not holding out much hope. Let's just hope I'm wrong. Hoping I'm wrong. Hoping I'm wrong. Mild amount more disassembly than I originally anticipated, but it just makes it easier to fit these fans up behind all this junk. So the other thing I did is I add um, these style, let me snake this thing back out. I add these style fan connectors to it. Um, I've had good luck with these up to 25, 30 amps without any issues. So this is how they're effectively gonna sit. This is what I was talking about with them sitting over the end tank. What I did was I sized them up, I got them on there. 
And I also, I marked the end tanks where they're gonna sit because I'm gonna pull the fans back off, hit them with the foam padding so they don't just rest firmly on the actual aluminum tubes. They have a little bit of a cushion there and do the same to the backside, do one fan at a time. Because of the way this core support is, I have to put the fan in this side and slide it over and then do the same thing for the second one and mount this side first. So you can see, again, I have marked both end tanks where those fans are gonna sit. So they're dead center as far as they can be on the radiator. The other thing I did was I actually slid these brackets back out and I actually moved the radiator backwards just a touch to get the clearance I needed on the bottom side of the radiator as well. <sighs> Stupid. And that's all she wrote. So we got the overlap I was talking about. These fans do seem way more stout. I still gotta reinstall the hood support, the bumper mount, the bumper, the intercooler. See what this thing will do. So movie magic, right? The video you just saw, I filmed that on Saturday. Today is Tuesday. So after I finished filming that, I put the bumper on the car, I went to fire it up, and it wouldn't fire up, it would just fire up and die. And I noticed on the dash, I had no TPS. My throttle wasn't showing whatsoever. So Sunday, I didn't come in the shop. I waited till Monday. Hal, the owner tuner here at Dynasty, came in, he plugged in, and he saw, yeah, I have no TPS, and my map sensor was reading like negative 30 PSI. Well, that kind of explains it. Like if the map sensor is kaput, it's going to show, it's going to sit in an area of the map that's pulling every bit of fuel it can, so it's just not going to fire up. Well, we did a little bit more looking around, and when I probe the TPS sensor, I have no 5-volt at the TPS. I have no 5-volt at the map sensor. So I'm going to give you guys like a 5-count. Think about what could have happened here that caused this issue. Okay. Again, this is the age-old, it works until it doesn't, right? Blame the tune, blame the computer, blame everything. Show you the current state of affairs. What I pulled apart here, wiring's everywhere. So I pulled out all the harness, I pulled the ECU down. I checked for 5 volt coming out of the ECU because I didn't have 5 volt at the TPS sensor. I didn't have it at the MAP sensor. And they share the same 5 volt, 5 volt power. So I pinned the back of the ECU and I had five volt at the ECU. So the five volt wasn't getting from the ECU to the sensor. So it's gotta be a short in the harness, right? There's something in the harness that's jacked up. So what do you do next? You look at all the live data and you see what other sensors are having an issue. Everything else is fine. Coolant temp, air temp, everything's fine. Like my fuel pressure sensor, everything was good. There was only one other sensor that was having an issue and that was the oil pressure sensor. Okay. so. Probably can't see it, but it's a Deutsch connector. You can't see it. That is the lead to my oil pressure sensor. I made an extension harness that ran down through the block and underneath the manifold, but it had plenty of clearance. Like it wasn't really close to anything heat related. And that's an important note. Here is the scrap yard of the oil pressure extension I made. And here are the leads that went into the temp sensor or the actual plug, not the, the sensor. You know what I'm talking about, the pressure sensor. These were the pins that were in there. You can see all of the wires were melted together. This is shielded three wire. And they that gloss is not there normally. Like this stuff all melted together. You can see they were shorting together. And when I unplugged this lead, I got TPS, I got uh, map sensor back, everything came back. So this, this wiring shorting together was killing that whole circuit. Now the question is why, why did that happen? Because legitimately this was not near any crazy heat source. And that is something that I still don't understand. And that circuit shouldn't have the juice to do this. So the only thing I can come up with is I used the jump box to start the car. So could that have had something to do with it? You'd think it would hurt the ECU before it would hurt this specific extension. Not only that, but it didn't hurt any of the Haltech wiring. It just hurt this extension. So could have been, was this, was the shielding somehow? I mean, I peeled all this back. So this was all covered. I peeled all this back. So this was fully covered, it was fully loomed. I don't know, drop your thoughts in the comments. All that to say, I gotta get this thing back together so I can fire it up and see if these fans make a difference. Everything's a chore. All right, got the ECU back in place, all the wiring's tucked back where it was. Key on, I hope, hey, let's hope I see TPS. Oh, look at that. It has tippus. Map sensor looks normal, so this thing hopefully will fire up. Yeah, baby. Whee! Sick! All right, again, the hope here is that it doesn't overheat. Now, 
coolant temps in Celsius. The formula for Celsius is actually elementary. You know what I mean? It's very simple. It's just nine fifths times whatever degree Celsius you're at. So like, like if it was five, it'd be nine fifths, you know, like times five. And then you add 32 to that. And then that's what it is. It's pretty easy. So if you didn't know that, you stupid, you stupid idiot. I definitely knew that. You can see it's at 45, 46, top left, see it? So that can't get past about 108, 110. Before it would climb and climb and climb and climb. And uh, I'm hoping that these fans take care of that. I'm using a factory thermostat in a straight housing. And again, that stand-up Griffin radiator that everybody on the internet tells you is awesome. And don't mind the oil pressure sign. That's just because I didn't put an oil pressure sensor back in yet. All right, fans are on. Thermostat's probably opening right about yonder way now. It's just factory temp thermostat. Hopefully this thing can kind of hover. I don't have any fan on on the front, right? So we have the dyno fan, you can see it's not on. The only fan that's other than what you hear under the hood, if you can hear that, is this rear fan pulling exhaust out of the shop so they don't smoke the place out. So let's, uh, let's see what it does. I will say, they're, uh, they don't feel like they're moving a ton of air, but it's, it's pulling from a colder spot than just pushing against the hot hot side, rather. So, fingers crossed. And for the you that are wondering, 90 degrees Celsius is about 194 degrees Fahrenheit. So, if it stays 210 or cooler, I'm cool with it. Which would be 99 degrees-ish Celsius, if you're wondering. Let's see what happens if I give it some RPM. Get the water pump actually moving, some cooling. Right, nice little drop. That should heat soak and just run away. All right, so I've revved on this thing a few times off camera. Let me see if I can get a video of it. Again, it's gonna be tough. I'm trying to try to one, two, three, four hand this out, getting all the way in the car. So you'd have the 90. dropping in temp is because the water pump's actually moving coolant. It's not just kind of sitting stagnant. Higher RPM, the water pump's moving more coolant, so it's passing through the radiator and getting cooled down. But if it, again, if it heat soaks and it starts to climb, we've been running for about 10 minutes now, and it's still staying there, which is good. It's a good sign. It's also only like 55, 60 degrees in the shop. So summertime, and there's, again, no fan on the front. So if you're at speed moving with the air over the radiator too, it may add to the cooling effect. Again, back to 91. Let's see. Sorry for the blurry video. I'm not a cinematographer. Okay. So that's about 25-ish minutes of runtime. This thing never got over 92 is the highest I saw it, which Again, I'm cool with that. Anything under 98, 99 degrees Celsius, I'm fine with. But I'm impressed. I didn't think that those fans would make that big of a difference. So if you're like me and, and you're doubting the fan use or you want to use a different fan, understand that in these perfectly ideal conditions, nice cool temp inside, they seem to do a good job. Now that is again with a giant T6 turbo hanging off the back of that radiator. So look at the, I mean, there's not much distance there. I have a heat blanket on it, but I mean, it's not cool under that hood at all. To illustrate that point, 352 degrees for my Amazon heat wrap. That's pretty cool. Turbo itself, 160, I don't want to touch it. Downpipe, 475. The metal on top of the radiator, 140. Brackets, radiator itself. 162 obviously some shiny metal can play games with these readings but that right there 360 and it's only that it's literally maybe an inch away a little bit more than an inch at most from the radiator and those so those derail Durali, however you pronounce it those twin 12s that overhang the end tanks seem to do the job 
So again, if you're like me and you're downing it or you're wondering what could, if you don't have a turbo right next to your radiator, I'm sure this would be even better. And I, tons of people swear by it. But again, I didn't, I didn't second guess it early in the video. I said, this isn't gonna work. Glass half empty. So far, so good. Sick. All right, to wrap up this whole video and just to kind of summarize Cliff Notes it, if you search F-Body stand-up radiator on Google, you're gonna find the best thread I found was an LS1 tech thread from years ago when forums were still popping, which I miss, but there's part numbers in there too. That, uh, those listings, or that listing, that thread rather, has the Griffin part number that has the inlet and the outlet on opposite sides. Because of the way they did this hot side, the inlet and outlet are on the same side for my radiator. So if you go to Summit or you go to Griffin's website, you can literally just search 27 and a half inches wide by 15 and a half inches tall. It'll bring up all of those radiators with different inlet and outlet locations, different core thicknesses, so on and so forth. Now, the derail part number is 16925. That's what I used. That's what that thread said to use. It's what I should have used in the first place. When I bought this car, it had a straight blade fan puller and a S blade fan puller on both sides of the front of the radiator pushing. And it had a single like 14 inch or, or 12 or 13 inch puller on the backside. So clearly whoever built this car originally saw temp issues as well and added another fan. But I would rather not block the pass pathway for the pushers to actually push air. So I just did the two derail pushers. I got rid of the 10 inch pullers that I had on there and we're in good shape. Appreciate you guys watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You don't have to, but I would appreciate it. And head over to clappedout.com slash store. We have stickers and dumb stuff for sale. Appreciate you guys. Have a blessed day.